Our uh, scripture reading for today is found in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Allow me to read to you. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to the ad advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and they're all the more to proclaim, pr proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The, the latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, so supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every, every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. May we call on Pastor Keith Ibrahim to share with us God's message. Thank you, Deacon Jose. Deacon Jose, I think that vacation in uh, Switzerland made you a much younger man. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Good morning, beloved. <laughs> Once again, it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, to be able to fellowship with one another, worship together, and uh, spend some time in the Word of God together. And uh, today, we are actually starting a new series uh, that's going to be for the next two months, and uh, the title of this uh, new series um, is Living Out the Gospel. So there's going to be a lot of practical messages on uh, living out the gospel uh, in our life as believers. This will be over the next couple of months. We will be looking in the book of Philippians, uh, we'll be looking in the gospel of Luke, and uh, also some uh, other, other passages. And today, we're going to begin this series by doing an overview of Philippians chapter 1. Uh, next week, uh, I will be back and we will do an overview of chapter 2. But in today, we're going to look at chapter 1. And as you see, the title of this message is Living as if God is in control. Now, if I asked you, is God in control of this world and of, our, of your life, uh, you would most probably say yes. Siempre, uh, right? Of course. But sometimes we don't live our lives uh, that way. Uh, sometimes we do not live as if God is in control. Uh, and that's why we worry and we fret and we're anxious over things. And as we're going to see today, as we look in Philippians chapter 1, uh, the Apostle Paul was living his life as if God was in control. But at this moment, uh, the Philippians were not. <laughs> and we're going to see that uh, in our scripture reading today as we look at that passage. But we're going to look basically an overview of the entire book of Philippians and chapter 1 uh, in this passage today. All right? So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Father, thank you for your word, uh, in particular the book of Philippians. And so as we begin our study uh, and we look at chapter 1 and the background of this book, again, we would ask that you would enable us to understand what Paul wrote and uh, how it applies to our life. And we thank you that we know that you are in control of all things. And yet sometimes uh, we become anxious, sometimes we become worried, and we live as if you're not in control. And so, Lord, speak to our hearts today through your word, and may the Lord Jesus Christ be greatly glorified for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, as always, I'd like to begin by doing a little bit of an introduction to the book of Philippians. Uh, this is for today and for the next uh, three weeks as we go through this book, because if you understand the historical background of this book, then you're going to understand much better uh, the passages of Scripture that we're going to look at. Okay? 
Uh, you know I love maps and geography, and so we want to begin by how the church in Philippi began. You remember that it was on the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul when he left Antioch in Syria, traveled around Galatia, and eventually landed up in Philippi. And when he was in Philippi in Macedonia on the second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, we saw that three particular events happened for the starting of the church. One was the salvation of Lydia. Do you remember Lydia, the seller of purple? She came to know the Lord, and the church began to meet in her house. The second event that happened there was when Paul cast out the demon from a slave girl, which resulted in him and Silas being thrown in prison. And so he was persecuted, thrown into prison. And then the third event uh, was the earthquake that the Lord caused at night. Uh, so while Paul and Silas were singing praises to the Lord in prison after being beaten, boy, you talk about living as if God was in control. They were singing praises, right? And so the Philippian jailer and his household came to know Christ because of that uh, earthquake that happened uh, in, that, uh, in that prison. So this was the start of the church of Philippi, and Paul always had a very good cordial relationship with the Philippians. As a matter of fact, a number of times they sent love gifts to him, missionary support, as he went on to other places preaching the gospel. Now later on in the book of Acts, we see that, remember, that Paul was arrested and he was in prison for Caesar, in Caesarea for two years. And then he was sent all the way to Rome to stand trial. And he was there for two years in Rome. And he is in Rome during this, what we call the first Roman imprisonment for two years that Paul wrote this book of Philippians in Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. It says, then Paul, this was in Rome, dwelt in two years, two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. So he had some freedom. He was able to receive visitors and he was preaching the kingdom of God teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one forbidding him. And so it was while he was in uh, prison in Rome that uh, he wrote this letter. Now listen very carefully as I share a series of events that happened that caused the Apostle Paul to write this letter. First of all, the Philippians in Philippi, those whom Paul led to the Lord, he was their spiritual father, they heard that he was in prison in Rome. And because of that, they lost their joy. They forgot that God is still in control, even though Paul was in prison, and they lost their joy. And so what they decided to do was to take a love offering and to send a financial gift to Paul in Rome to help him. And so they took this love gift and they gave it to one of their members named Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus left Philippi, brought the love gift to Paul in Rome. And so Philippians is also a thank you letter for the love gift that the Philippians had sent him. Now, when Epaphroditus arrived, him and Paul, of course, probably had wonderful fellowship as Epaphroditus was sharing an update of the things going on in, in Philippi. But you know what? Epaphroditus found out that the money he had brought, the love gift, wasn't enough to meet Paul's needs. And so what he did was he went to work. And when he went to work to earn money to help Paul, he got sick. And he got so sick that he was, uh, it was possible that he would die. That's how sick he was. Well, news got back to the Philippians that Epaphroditus was sick and he might die. 
So now they lost their joy, not just because of Paul's imprisonment. Now they were doubly <laughs> lost their joy because of Epaphroditus' illness. Now, follow along with me here, okay? Epaphroditus heard that the, Philipp the Philippians were upset because he was sick. So he became upset because they were upset because he was sick. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> All right. And so the Philippians are upset about Epaphroditus. He's upset because they're upset because he's sick. Well, the Lord spared Epaphroditus and he got better. And Paul decided at that point, he turned to Epaphroditus and said, Epaph, I don't know, I'm just guessing that was his nickname. Epaph, listen, uh, I need to send you back to Philippi be, so, to encourage uh, the folks back there. But before you go, let me sit down and write them a letter and deal with some of the issues that you told me about in the church and to encourage them and to thank them for the love gift. And so Epaphroditus took this letter, went back to Philippi, and gave it to the church there. And so that is why, as we read through the uh, book of Philippians, the theme is what? Joy. Now, Warren Wiersbe wrote a little commentary, Be Joyful, about uh, the book of Philippians. And the reason why Paul keeps telling them to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, the reason why he emphasizes this is because they had lost their joy. Why? Because they forgot practically in their life that God is in control. He's in control of their lives. He's in control of Paul's life, even though he's in prison. And so that's why we have this theme running throughout this book. And so, uh, again, Paul is encouraging them uh, to be joyful and to know that God is still in control. Now, let's be honest, okay? Intellectually, we do know God's in control. On Friday nights, and as we're going through the book of Daniel, we're seeing clearly that God is in control of all the world empires, the Gentile world empires. He rules in the kingdom of men and sits over it whomever he will and sits over it the basest of men. I mean, we've been seeing God's sovereignty uh, over and control of earth history. And we know that it's going to culminate in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the setting up of his kingdom. But here, this morning, we're looking about not that God is in control of the nations and history, but he's in control of your and my individual life. He's sovereign. He leads. He guides. He controls and we need to practically, daily, rest in that, believe that, so that even if something like what happened to Paul, he's in prison. He had just finished two years in prison in Caesarea. He suffered shipwreck on the way to Rome, and now he's in prison in Rome for two years, and yet God is still totally in control of the events of his life. And the same thing is true for you and for me. Whatever tribulations, whatever hardships, whatever difficulties, whatever challenges we have, we always need to stand firm in the faith knowing that God has either allowed this to come into our life or he has even caused it to come into our life, again, to help us to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to live our lives as if God is in control. Now, I'm going to go through the book of Philippians chapter 1 today, but I'm only going to go through quickly some verses, but we're going to center in on the verses that emphasize the Lord being in control here, okay? So beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, we see, 
Paul begins by saying, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Just a couple things we want to notice in this verse. You remember that Timothy was with Paul on that second missionary journey when he founded the church in Philippi. So the Philippians knew Timothy, but now he was with Paul in Rome. And notice that even at this point, the church in Philippi had structure. They had bishops or elders, pastors, and they had deacons. So he's writing to them. And now he, uh, he talks about how he thanks God for them, their salvation, their walk with the Lord every time he thinks about them. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with what? Joy. Boy, he's going to get right into joy. He's in prison, <laughs> and he has joy. They're free, and they do not, all right? And so for their fellowship, now notice verse 5. He prays for them with joy because of their fellowship, koinonia, to have in common, in the gospel from the very first day until now. What was the first day? The first day was when Lydia got saved and welcomed them into her house. And so from the very first day, the Philippian church and Paul had fellowship together, beginning in the first day. And then in verse 6, a very well-known verse to many of us, Paul expresses his confidence that the Lord who began a good work in you, that work of transforming us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ to help us grow to spiritual maturity, God who began that good work, he will complete it. He will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. We can rest knowing God is in control of our lives because God continually, day after day after day, is transforming us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will be faithful to continue to do so. So whatever the trial is, whatever the tribulation is, we can be comforted and encouraged and still have joy even though it's a difficult situation. Remember what uh, James wrote? James wrote to the believers that were suffering. He says, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, right? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And patience, let patience have its perfect work to make us complete in Christ. And so he expresses this confidence. Then in verses 9, 10, and 11, Paul tells them what he prays for for them. And in our prayer lives, it's good for us to model the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And you'll notice that he accents the spiritual growth of the Philippians. He says, and this I pray, here's his prayer, that your love may abound still more and more. First, he grows that they, prays that they will grow in their love for one another, their love for the Lord, their love for the lost, their love for each other as brethren in Christ. They grow in love. Not only that, but in knowledge and discernment, that they will grow in their understanding of the Word of God, that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in a deeper way through knowing his word, and therefore having discernment. Verse 10, he prays that they would approve things that are excellent and that they would be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So he prays that they would live righteous lives conforming their lives to the standards of the Word of God so that God would be glorified in their lives. Okay? And again, I'm just, this is an overview so, of chapter 1. Uh, we just can't, don't have the time, otherwise we'd be here till tonight if we're going to cover the entire verse uh, in detail. 
But what I want to do now is I want to focus a little bit more on the next passage beginning at verse 12. Because here Paul is going to write about his circumstances, his circumstances. Remember, where is he when he wrote this? In prison in Rome, right? And so he wants to assure them that God is in control and that his imprisonment did not hinder the gospel. It actually helped it along and promoted it. So in verse 12, he says, but I want you to know, brethren, this is something they didn't know. Their thinking was, oh, Paul's in prison. Therefore, his ministry is over. He can't do anything, right? But he says, no, that's not the case. And here we're going to see the principle that no matter what the circumstances are in our lives, there are opportunities to minister. There are opportunities to share the gospel. Too often we focus on the things that we cannot do because of our limitations. But Paul here is going to point out that that's not what we're to focus on. Don't focus on what you cannot do. Focus on what you can do. Because God is in control, and whatever open doors he has for you in your life at this moment, those are the ones we need to uh, take advantage of and use. So he says, I want you to know, brethren, the things that happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. All right? The gospel is not hindered here. The gospel is never hindered by our circumstances. It just opens up a different opportunity. And then he gives two ways that his imprisonment actually has furthered the gospel. Number one, he says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard, the praetorium, and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Now, Paul, under house arrest, he would have been chained to a Roman soldier, and that Roman soldier would have to stay with him for a certain number of hours before his shift was over, and then another soldier came and was chained to him. So guess what Paul did to those soldiers when they came to start their shift? What did he do? He was witnessing to them. Boy, you talk about a, a, an opportunity. You talk about somebody who has to listen to what you're saying, the guy you're chained to. And so a guard would come in and Paul would tell him, the Lord Jesus Christ, he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. <laughs> and the guy's like, listen, he goes out, the next guy comes in, the Lord Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for your sins. I mean, you talk about a captive audience. And so many of the praetorium guards, again, God was in control. It was God's will for Paul to witness to these praetorium guards. And the way the Lord arranged for it to happen was for Paul to be sent to Rome as a prisoner. Right? Was God still in control? Yeah, the Philippians forgot that. The Philippians forgot. Paul did not. As a matter of fact, over in chapter 4, at the end of this epistle, Paul writes, All the saints greet you, believers in Rome. And then he says this, Especially those who are of what? <laughs> Caesar's household. Even some of those in Caesar's household came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And they were saying, hey, make sure you tell the Philippians we say hi. <laughs> make sure you tell them. And so the gospel is not bound. And no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what, there's always opportunity. And God is in control. Well, a second way that the gospel was actually furthered by his imprisonment, we see in verse 14. He says, and most of the brethren in the Lord. He's talking about believers in Rome. 
having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You see, the Roman believers knew that Paul was there in prison. And they started thinking among themselves, you know what? Let's go out and preach the gospel. If they arrest us, so what? We'll be with Paul. <laughs> and so his imprisonment emboldened them, gave them confidence so that the Roman believers were sharing the gospel in a greater way than they ever had before. Apparently, before Paul was in prison, they were a little bit of afraid of persecution and being arrested. But then they thought, well, if we get arrested, we'll be with Paul. So what? Right? And so these two ways, the Praetorium Guard and, Paul, and God used Paul's imprisonment to uh, challenge and to encourage the believers in Rome to be more faithful in their witnessing. Now he talks, though, about the motives of those believers who are sharing the gospel. And we're going to see that it's possible to be faithful in the ministry, but to do it for the wrong motives. You know, we need to guard our hearts. And we're going to see that some of the believers were witnessing and sharing the gospel out of right motives, and others were doing it out of wrong motives. Now, they were preaching the right gospel. Understand this. They weren't preaching a false gospel. They were preaching the true gospel, but for the wrong reasons. And this is a warning to us. So in verse 15, he says, Some of those preaching the gospel indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. You see, there were some that were jealous of the Apostle Paul and his ministry. There were some who envied him. And they preached because they were envious of him, and it caused strife. Sad to say, that still happens today. Sad to say, some believers, some pastors, some people who witness are doing it for the wrong reasons. They're envious of the ministries of others who have ministries greater than theirs in number. And so these were preaching out of envy and strife. Others, though, out of goodwill. Others had the right heart, the right motive, and were doing it for the glory of God, right? For the glory of God. Verse 16 says, the former, those that were preaching the right gospel for the wrong reason, preach from selfish ambition. You see, they wanted to be a somebody. They wanted to be important. They were doing it out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, not with a sincere heart, supposing to add affliction to my chains. Now, this is pretty pathetic. What they were apparently doing was trying to make Paul jealous of them <laughs> just as they were jealous of him. But as we're going to see, Paul did not fall for that. Uh, he was much more spiritually mature than these people are. And so, again, there are people who preach the gospel uh, and for the wrong reasons, now, in Corinth, you'll remember that one of the problems in the Corinthians church is that they were fighting and arguing over their favorite Bible teacher. Paul had planted the church at first, right, in the second missionary journey. And after he left, Apollos came along, and he fed the people the word of God and built them up. So some of the Corinthians thought Paul was their favorite Bible teacher, Others thought Apollos was their favorite Bible teacher, right? And so they began to argue about it. You talk about spiritual immaturity, right? And so Paul deals with this issue. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, Who then is Paul? Paul's nothing. Paul's nobody. Who is Apollos? Nothing. Nobody. We're just ministers through whom you believe. That's all. 
servants, slaves, as the Lord gave to each one. The Lord gave Paul his opportunity to minister there, and then the Lord gave Apollos his opportunity to minister there. He says, I planted, when he preached the gospel at the first, Apollos watered by coming and preaching the word of God, but it's God who gives the increase. And so God uses many different Bible teachers in our lives to help us grow. He says in verse 7, So then neither he who plants, that's Paul, is anything, nor he who waters, that's Apollos, but God who gives the increase. See, God is the one who saves people. God is the one who helps them grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastors, preachers, evangelists, we're just ministers that God uses to bring it about. But I want you to notice verse 8. He says, now he who plants and he who waters are what? One. We're on the same team. All right? There's no place for competition, jealousy, envy between ministers or those who witness or those who share. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward from the Lord according to his own labor. And so we see that this jealousy, this envy, this self-ambition of these Roman believers who were sharing the gospel because of Paul's imprisonment were doing it for the wrong motive in a sense of competition, wanting to make Paul jealous or envious. Well... Like he said, some of them were preaching the gospel with the wrong motive, but here he mentions the ones who are preaching the gospel with the right motive. He says, but the latter, those out of goodwill, they're preaching the gospel out of love, love for the Lord, love for Paul, love for the lost. You see, they had the right motive, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. They knew Paul's calling, and his ministry was by God, and they loved him for it. And so these were preaching the gospel for the right motive. But again, the, is God still in control? Yes, he is. He's still in control. And then verse 18, notice Paul's conclusion. Notice, he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense, the wrong motive, or in truth, all right? Christ is preached, and in this I, will re I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. This is how we know those preaching the gospel for the wrong motive were preaching the right gospel, all right? Because Paul would never rejoice if someone was preaching a false gospel. And so Paul says, well, some are doing it for the right reasons, some are not, but Christ is being preached. And in that truth, in that fact, I am going to rejoice, rejoice. And again, you, you can just sense from what Paul writes that he has peace in his heart and he knows that God is in control of his life, even though... He's been imprisoned, and that his imprisonment actually has furthered the gospel, furthered the gospel. Well, now in verse 19, Paul was going to be standing trial in Rome, and it's possible he could be executed if he's found guilty. But as we're going to see, he was confident that he would be found not guilty, and then he would be released. In Philippians 1.19, he says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Again, not guilty in when he stands before trial. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So through their prayers for him and through the work of the Holy Spirit, he was confident that he would be uh, exonerated. 
And then he says, this is according to my earnest or sincere expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And here we saw that, you know, Paul, he wanted Christ to be magnified, <laughs> to be exalted, to be glorified in his life, no matter what happens. That God would be glorified, the Lord would be magnified through his death, if he was put to death, or through his life, if he was released. But he was confident that he would be released and we do believe he was released and on to do his ministry after this particular imprisonment. And then in verse 21, a very familiar verse to many of us, he says, for to me, to live is what? Christ. For me to live, it's Christ living in and through me. That's what life is. But to die is gain. To die is gain. And we as believers need to always remember to die, to be put to death, especially martyrdom for the faith, is gain. It's a blessing to us. The reason being, 2 Corinthians 5.8, we are confident, yes, well, please rather, to be absent from the body when we're dead and to be what? present with the Lord. So for us, death is gain. Death is being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving all glory to the Lamb, as we sang about earlier. And so Paul, you know, to die, die is gain, to live on, that's Christ. He says, but if I live on in the flesh, I'm found not guilty. This will mean fruit for my labor. Gets to go out and preach some more minister some more. And then he says something very interesting. This is a perspective that every believer needs to have. He says, yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Paul couldn't decide whether he preferred to live or to die. Does that sound strange? <laughs> I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two. On one hand, having a desire to, to be part and be with Christ, that's far better, right? I mean, to die as a believer is the greatest thing that can happen to us, because then we're with Christ. He says, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh, to still be alive, is more needful for you. More needful for you. So, Paul, I like the old King James, was caught in a strait betwixt two. He had two desires. On one hand, he wanted a desire to stay, to continue to minister. But on the other hand, he desired to die to be with Christ. That's a very healthy view for a believer. Sometimes, and some believers are too attached to this world. And they don't want to die no matter what because they're not focusing on going in to be with Christ. They're focusing on this world and this life. Others are too heavenly minded, right? Uh, and they're therefore not serving and walking with the Lord in this life. But a healthy view of a believer is to have this tension between wanting to stay to minister to others, but at the same time wanting to go and be with Christ. And because God is in control of all things, if we just follow him, we know that in his time and in his way, he will bring us home. He will bring us home. Because even in death, God is in control. He's in control of your life and of mine. He's in control. Well, the last part of this chapter, Paul begins to address some other issues with uh, the Philippians. 
in verse 27, he's going to exhort them to unity. You see, we'll find out later on in the book of Philippians, the Philippians, although they were a wonderful church, they had a little problem with disunity. In particular, two ladies, two ladies who were leaders in the church who were fighting with each other, Eodia and Syntyche. Find out about them later on in the book of Philippians. But Epaphroditus explained to Paul, you know, Eodia sits over here and Syntyche sits over there and they're just not getting along very well and the whole church knows about it. <laughs> and so Paul's going to exhort them later on. And so another theme in Philippians is not just joy. It's not just a thank you note for the love gift. It's also an exhortation to be one, to be unified. So in verse 27, he writes, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Okay? Our behavior, our conduct should be worthy of the Lord Jesus. So that whether I come and see you or if I remain absent, I may hear of your affairs, and this is what he wanted to hear, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul says, whether I come to you or whether or not, I want to hear that you are walking in unity, that you are striving together for the faith of the gospel. He mentions this unity again in chapter 2, verse 2, when he says, fulfill my joy. In other words, make my joy complete. How? By being like-minded, having the same love, one for the other, being of one accord and of one mind. You see, unity in the church is extremely important because one way that the devil likes to divide and destroy churches is by bringing division among the members. And as we're going to see, the reason why division comes is because self-ambition of people in the church. Verse 3. He says, let nothing be done through selfish, am, selfish ambition or conceit, pride, arrogance. Nothing begins to divide the church more when church members become selfish, proud, and arrogant. He says, but instead of being self-ambitious and conceit, in lowliness of mind or in humility, let each esteem others better than themselves. So Paul says the way for a church to have unity is by everyone walking in humility and everyone esteeming others better than ourselves, putting others first. Let each of you not look only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. See, a church that is unified, Yodia and Syntyche, <laughs> whatever their problem was with each other, they weren't promoting unity in the church. They were, they were destroying it. The devil was using them to destroy the unity of the church, which is really a terrible thing. And so Paul exhorts them to be of one mind, one heart, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And we at UCCC, we also need to strive together, be of one mind, of one heart, moving forward for the grace, of, for the faith of the gospel. All right, another thing he says as he brings this chapter to a close is, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries. If you're a believer, you're going to have adversaries, unbelievers who are not going to like you because you believe the Bible, because you live righteously, and they do not. And the tendency for a believer is to be afraid of unbelievers who persecute them. But Paul says, no. 
God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. Don't be afraid. Don't be terrified by your adversaries. And when you're not terrified of your adversaries, to them, that's a proof of perdition or destruction. That's evidence to them that they're on the losing side. But to you, of salvation. And that is from God. We always want to remember what the Lord Jesus told the disciples as he was sending them out as sheep among wolves. He says in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. The worst an unbeliever can do to you is kill you. But that's gain. That's far better. You're now with the Lord. (laughs) That's all they can do. He says, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. God's the one we are to fear, to be God-fearing people who have a healthy fear of the Lord, right? And so Paul says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And another reason why we cannot be afraid of adversaries is because we know God is in control. God is in control. And we need to live that way. Live that way. Verse 29, he says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You know, as believers, there's two things that we get, all right? We get to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and all the blessings that come with that, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, right? Being transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, to be adopted into his family and have eternal life, all right? So we get all those goodies, if you will, but we also get to suffer for his sake. Paul wrote to Timothy that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's going to happen. Some of us suffer worse than others, but it's going to happen. But God is still in control. Still in control. In the last verse, he says, to the Philippians, that the Philippians had the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Well, what's the conflict that Paul, they saw Paul have, and now we're hearing that he had? What was it? Well, persecution for sure. Remember that after he had cast out the the demon from the slave girl, they beat him and then threw him in jail. So persecution, but also imprisonment, right? He was in prison in Philippi when he was with them, and now he's in prison. And so some of the Philippians were also being persecuted for their faith in Christ, and it's possible that some of them may even have been put into prison because of it, put into prison. So, beloved, this is an overview, gives us a little bit about the background of the book of Philippians and why Paul decided to write this letter. And we see in chapter 1, in these particular passages, that we can live our life as if God is in control because he is. Because he is. And don't be afraid to die because to die is gain. To go and be with the Lord is far better. Far better. And so no matter what difficulties, no matter what hardships, we can rejoice in the Lord always, right? Again, I say rejoice and trust our faithful God uh, with his will and his purposes in our life. So next week, chapter 2, another uh, overview of the book of Philippians. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word today. And thank you for the Apostle Paul, how he recognized
that his imprisonment actually furthered the gospel in these two ways of the Praetorium Guard and those of Caesar's household being saved and also through the boldness of the Roman believers to preach the gospel. And that's why Paul was able to keep his joy even in difficult circumstances. Father, our prayer is that you would help us to always remember that you love us, that you're in control of our lives, and that no matter what happens, we can rest in you. And if ever we're anxious about anything, we can pray and cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Thank you for your word today. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.